play shooters. It's that time again. That time again. These guys aren't just anybody. They're good. It's time for the Dead Pair Podcast with Jason Rambo. Does your brain hear what your mouth is saying? And Sean Alley. He's large and in charge. Here to bring you all things sporting plays from the ins and outs tips and tricks, news and gossip from pro shooters, service and industry specialists, coaches, clubs, and more. Often imitated, never duplicated. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only... Welcome everyone to the Dead Pair Podcast. Yeah, the Dead Pair Podcast, energized by KLMO Game Board US. What's up, Mr. Largen in charge? We are here. We are in studio. We are ready to get busy. And I'm about as nervous as a long tail cat in a room full of rocking chairs. Why because we have the big boss here. The big boss. The producer. My wife, Julie. What's <clears throat> up, Jules? Hi. You're just going to sit there and stare at me. I'm waiting for a smack in the back of the head at any moment. Yeah, Jules, is there any particular reason you're here? I mean, I, I, I've heard some rumors that we have to kind of keep Listen, Jason in it's check. It's to keep me in line. There's and, no other uh, reason. And she's here to, with, the, with the cattle prod to uh, make sure Jason stays in line. I think the, that's what it is. Nobody can see this. She's laughing at Sean and giving me the hairy eyeball at the same time. So <laughs> There's some truth behind that, though. Yeah. There's some truth behind that. I'm just listening for uhs and ums and <laughs> glasses. I think, I think we're being critiqued. Yeah, well, that stuff. Sorry. It, it happens. Yeah. It's what makes this thing real. Yes. <laughs> I keep telling her, quit cutting all that stuff out. And then she perfects it. And I'm like, all right, leave it alone. Yeah. So. I think people know... If, from here on out, we sit here with a drink or two while we're doing this because, hey. We can. We can, and why not? <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, everyone has heard us flap our gums and brag about the Ohio State Championship. It is now up on Score Chaser. The dates are August 4th through the 7th. Um, if you guys want to come see what we've been bragging about for over a year now, now's your chance. I know there's some big names that are about to sign up. They've already have – they've been up for a week, and they already have 170 people registered, which is – Really fast. Right, and, um, and John Kruger's coming back to set targets again this year. Correct. Uh, that was really cool to see those kind of, I want to say they're old school, but they are kind of, sort of. You don't get a lot of those big targets that you do from some of the big name target setters. I mean, John is definitely going from the old school playbook in how he sets his targets. Yeah, they're fun targets that make you say choice words twice as much when you miss them. Yes, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great way to put it. So, um, hey, they are looking for event sponsors right now. Um, they only have a limited number of slots for that, but they they are asking for some help. Um, if you're interested, you can email them at Hillendale, all one word, H I L L N D A L E dot club at frontier dot com, or call three three zero seven two five two zero nine seven. Um, I'm telling you, if you or someone you know has a company and you want to sponsor a shoot, this is definitely one to do it. Uh, it's not going to cost you as much as one of the big, you know, national shoots, but this um, th- you're going to get in front of a lot of people. Yeah, I think the the Ohio State shoot, I think, is what the third largest, third largest in the country, right? right. Now. Yeah, so yeah. it's not a small shoot by any means. No, I think last year there was north of 400 entries. Yeah, uh, into the shoot, and um, I think it's going to be bigger this year. Yeah, and, and, and let's put it this way: Hillendale is one of the most beautiful clubs you'll go to. I mean, the, oh. the terrain, the trees, the, the ponds, everything. It's just a great place to Absolutely shoot Absolutely gorgeous place. And they, they really ran a, a good event last year um, as far as schedule goes. Yep. Didn't have any backups. No, everything Sean Spindell and his crew there, they do a bang-up job just making that thing run like a Swiss excellent watch. Excellent food. Excellent food. So lots of vendors on Vendor Row. Yep. Um, so yep. it's a lot of fun. You guys, seriously, consider it. Check it out. August 4th through the 7th at Hillendale Club in Medina, Ohio. We'd love to see you up there. Of course, Sean and I will be there. Well, Sean will be there large and in charge. I'll just be there in charge, I guess. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll run with that, I guess. Yeah. Well, changing gears, another idea we're having for a future show uh, that we've got some requests for is a show about me and Jason. Uh, questions for us. Um, a lot of guys are asking like how we got started, why we do some of the things we do, um, how we got the podcast started. So we thought we maybe do a show on that just to kind of give a little backstory. So a little Q and a with us. <clears throat> if you guys have any 
requests or questions that you would like to hear about on that episode, uh, reach out to us, send us an email, post it up on our Facebook page, and uh, we're going to try to build a a show around that, and hopefully it'll be entertaining enough for you guys to take a listen to. And just not any coaching questions, because we're nowhere near coaches. Nope, nope. And, in fact, if you could leave shooting out of it altogether, my scores are not reflection of something (laughs) you'd want to hear about. So You mean we're just like everybody else other than the big names? I got you. But, no, um... I didn't think this would ever be relevant, but we seriously have had a lot of people push us for this, and I guess we'll go with it. If we get enough questions and we can put together, I don't know, a half hour, 45 minutes, we'll do it. Heck so, yeah. Why but, not? Uh, send us an email, real easy. Uh, go to the website, hit the contact button, and those emails will come right to both Sean and I. Right. So, right. Um, you're over there looking at me funny again. What did I do? Am I in trouble? <laughs> Nothing yet. I see that stick that's in her hand. She's ready. She's it's like a it's like a nun at a Catholic school with a ruler, you know? <laughs> right. like, whack! Ready to wrap them knuckles. Yes. <laughs> so you wanted me here. <laughs> I <don't, clears throat> remember. Regret. Yeah, Jason <clears throat> might be rethinking that whole thing. Uh, yeah. So you you had some questions? I had some questions. Well, I don't know. For Jules, Jules, uh, what's your take on this whole bit, the podcast that you are the behind the scenes person uh, we've mentioned it many times the person that actually takes all the work and puts these podcasts together and cleans them up makes them listenable and you do a fantastic job uh any thoughts comments things that we're doing that we need to improve upon i mean go ahead lay it out there we, we got broad shoulders <laughs> no i think you guys do a great job um you know See, there I said, um, I get to edit that out. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks, is it? Yeah, right? Yeah, the thing that I do is, like you said, trying to make it as listenable as possible, get rid of a lot of pauses and that sort of thing, trying to make the guests sound or they would want to listen to it and tell their friends and family that they were on it because they sound great. Yeah. Uh, it was a learning curve for sure with the Adobe um, audition that we use. I'd never used it before. Right. You guys were new at this. I was new at that. So still working out some of the bugs. But overall, no, it's fun to listen to. Um, some of the guests, Anthony Matteris, I know is your hero. He's mine too because by far the easiest person to edit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just every time he opens his mouth, it's like, yep, that's good. That's good. No problem there. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it took me, I think, you know, maybe a couple hours was all on that one because he was great. Yeah. Um, I know but... you got a special place in your heart for David or Dulovic <laughs> because... <laughs> Because <laughs> I think there's some extra editing that has to go on with when David comes on the show. Right. And then you're like, wait, what did he say? Did he say that again? I think he repeated that <laughs> one twice. Should I take that out and make it sound a little bit more? Most of the time, I got to check out a thesaurus <laughs> or an encyclopedia to make sure I understand exactly well, what he was saying. Well, but. on that point, I thought about getting you guys a thesaurus. So, you know, any of the, the words maybe that we can put on the whiteboard. Um, for anybody who listens often, um, I think we need to eliminate gotcha. Um, okay. All right. I, I cut a lot of those. Gotcha. So. <laughs> Case awesome. in point. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. I think, right? I think gotcha, awesome, and what was the other one that we were told we weren't allowed to use anymore? And then it's like. In the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. And the very next podcast, you and I sounded like we had never done this before. Right, yeah. We're trying so hard not to use those words. Yeah, it you know? still crept up 14 or 15 times, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Right. So, so but <laughs> now it's it's um, it's funny because, you know, Jules, I'll, I'll tell everybody one of our private conversations is we, you know, I take this material home and she's like, why are you guys doing this? Who's tapping on the table and who's coughing? And but when you try to take out a natural reaction like coughing or twitching, you know, twiddling your thumbs or whatever that something you're doing playing with a pen on the desk or whatever that makes a noise Mm -hmm. you don't consciously think about those things ice clinking in a glass not saying that ever happens that's your problem oh okay i think really called you out on that one. he did you know he busted me that time but you know what that was actually pretty funny when he mentioned it yes but no i mean it's when you take those things that you do subconsciously and now all of a sudden you're consciously aware of them you're afraid to do anything you know, it's like, is this right? <laughs> you know. Well, we so. are who we are, and our mannerisms and how we talk are kind of programmed at this point. I mean, both you and I are pushing fifty, so it's going to be hard to unlearn what we've learned at this point. I, I know, think, right? 
So but we'll keep trying, Jules. We'll keep trying. We'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get it one of these days. No, uh, I don't want you to focus on the the pen tapping because that takes away. From that's the that guy over there. That's Mister <laughs> Mister Nervous Nelly. He's playing Van Halen drummer over there on yeah. his on his pad. So I don't know. We, we'll leave that alone. Chad calls me Rev Limiter. So. Yeah, that's a pretty pretty good description there. But anyway, okay, enough of all this silliness. We need to get on to our guest. Yeah, uh, we've got Mr. Kyle Millwood coming on, and uh, Kyle's a great guy. Got to spend a little bit of time with him down at the uh, Game Boy Invitational last fall, and uh, we talked for a bit, and he's a super cool guy, and uh, can't wait to get him on here. Well, you know, we interviewed him at the Nationals, but I was I felt really bad because we had so many people. Look, people were waiting. Yeah, it was short. Room, yeah, it was short. And, uh, it was very short. I wanted to dive into some more of the stuff that, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk to, so let's get him on the phone. Got it. All right, finally... On the phone with us, Kyle Millwood. What's up, Kyle? Not a lot. How about y'all? Uh, we're just jealous as hell because you're down there in warm weather and we're not. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's cold for us, but I'm sure it's warm for y'all. Yeah. Well, spring's coming. That's what we all look forward to. So, um, Kyle, we, we did an interview with you at the Nationals, but I wanted to take the time to dive a little deeper into you and do a full podcast with you. Um, tell everybody where you're from from uh precise georgia it's middle georgia about an hour south of atlanta uh the meadows everybody knows the meadows i'm i'm within hearing distance of the meadows gotcha how did you get started in the shooting kyle uh actually my uncle worked out there when i was in middle school and he went on and left a, a void at the gun club and me and my brother started working there so that was where i I guess I learned the work side of it and got a career. And, and after a couple of years of not having a hobby or, or hobbies changing, looking for something, I was like, well, I'm going to go back and, and give it another try and try the, try the fun side of it. Right. Now you and your family, you have a clearing business. Am I correct in saying that? Uh, kinda. It's basically logging, uh, traditional logging, except instead of putting the tree on a, on a trailer as a tree, we chip it up in the woods and kind of blow it into a trailer and haul it as fuel wood to the mill. And they, you know, burn it for electricity and heat and, and green credits. Gotcha. Okay. So we clear the trees. It's kind of the, the stumps and whatever's left is, is theirs, but because it's a chipper, it, it leaves a, a much nicer job. Okay. Well, Kyle, I'm going to circle back here. Let's, let's get going on some of the nitty gritty. Uh, so when did you start shooting registered targets? I want to say it was maybe six oh six oh seven. I know my first trip to nationals was in twenty ten. Okay, you got that's the- when I sure enough got the bug and and was like, all right, I got to go to this one. This is the this is the Super Bowl. Okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so, what made you make the decision though to start shooting registered targets? I mean, all through school, just working out there, seeing it. I mean, you know, I enjoy the setting the courses and even maybe some teaching and, and getting ready for the big shoots. But on the work side of it, you know, the two weeks before it was, you know, all you could do to get ready and, and just go, go, go. And then the actual tournament, you kind of relax as long, as long as you didn't have anything major, mm-hmm. you know, happen or go wrong. Then you kind of coasted the work was right before and right after the big one. So I was okay. like, well, that was enjoyable. Let's, uh, let's go shoot a big one and, and see how, See how that goes. Okay, gotcha. Um, so along the way, I'm sure you got some instruction. Who's Who has helped you along? Who's been some of your coaches or teachers? When I worked out there way back, uh, Pete and Wendy Crabtree were there, and they were running the meadows. I pulled for countless hours of lessons and kind of heard everything there is to hear about it. And so I guess that's where I learned. And then many, many years of shooting it on my own, kind of learned it and started shooting tournaments on the road with Kevin to Michael and, uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily a lesson, but if you, if you pay attention, every time you shoot with somebody better than you are, it is a lesson. Oh yeah. Right. So, oh, yeah. you know, I learned, I had probably four or five years of, you know, at least once or twice a month, we were on the road going somewhere and, and that was, you know, that was a lesson for me. So it's, you know, big thanks to him, but I took a, I may call it one or two from Bill McGuire and, and, uh, Zach King bomb had a, you know, couple of golf cart chats. And then after we got done shooting, I've kind of went back and forth with Anthony just on some, 
you know, just mental game or, or just a couple of mistakes I made that wanted extra input on it. So, you know, asked him after the fact and that helped tremendously also. I mean, he's the, he's the guru. Yeah, absolutely. So fast forward to today, do you still practice at the meadows or do you have your own land and traps or? Yeah, I, uh, I, I probably shoot too much at the meadows. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm there. I'm there as much as they are. Uh, I, I live a mile and a half down the road, so if I if I'm home 30 minutes early, I can run over there and you know shoot a box or two, or you know either before dark or before I gotta be somewhere. Then I can do that. Or I've got five clubs within an hour and 10 minutes of the house, so I can I can be almost anywhere in Georgia that's you know centrally located. Right. Quickly, Far City, Savannah. They're only you know three hours away, and that's not. That's not bad either. Well, I'm sure Dominic loves seeing you there every day. So yeah, that's for sure. And, uh, they're they're quite often. So you've been on the tour for quite a while. What are some of your big accomplishments that you're most proud of? I would say my first big accomplishment was a cake up at the nationals, shot 99, along with eight other guys. But that was a, a, a called a career high score wise and it being there, that was a big deal for me. Last year, the heat is on at Backwoods. That you know, I HOA that one. That was the first two day win. That was that was huge. That was definitely the pinnacle so far. That I, you know, I don't know even how to describe it. That's it's magical. You you have been trying for twenty years and you know finally start getting into it pretty good or or, or shooting a lot and and trying to go to everything you can and and able to for the most part and just that was a that was a goal or i mean maybe even call it a dream that you know hey one day i want to win a win a big one and right granted it it wasn't a regional but a a two-day main is a is a a hard one to accomplish especially with you know multiple big names there and it, it was it was fun it's a it's addictive right um is there any events or events that you look forward to every year to shoot at mainly the nationals i mean that's you know that's a the big one it's you know it's the pinnacle everybody's there you know for me it's always been a you know go see how you stack up and now maybe hopefully creeping up the ladder like i'm closer and closer to being among or with these guys that have you know been at the top just day in and day out Mm -hmm. the meadows has had national wild turkey for several years uh I've only missed one of those. That was last year because I kind of committed to the regional tour or championship tour. So that just that one's home and Georgia State. That's huge here. It's it's a growing shoot. Last year we had you know record numbers and pretty much everything in Georgia. Anything other than that, I'd say any of the regionals. That's is kind of the that's test day. Go see how you how you measure up. Right. Okay. Well, well Kyle, I want to ask you a little bit about your shooting style. I know that you've. Uh, toured around with Kevin quite a bit and everybody knows that he's a little bit of a, a fast in the box type of guy. And it seems like you kind of follow that same mindset to a degree. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I learned from watching him, you know, or, or refined what I thought I had learned. We've got our differences, but we're also a lot alike or I'm a lot of like him just because that's how, how what I watched for multiple years and, and kind of figured it out, so to speak. Well, Believe it or not, of all people in this world, my wife had a really good question. She's not going to ask it because she's up sitting over there being quiet. But in editing all these podcasts, she picks up on things. And right. one of the things she talked about was pre-shot and post-shot routine. With you being quick in the box, you're still running that, but you're just running it in a real fast manner, correct? I would like to think so. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's There's less... Uh, less procedure to it i'm i'm more of a like just call my free shot when i see the pair you know i'm pretty much seeing where they're at try to find the line of you know maybe somewhere and where to hold and then you know if i'm the next the next person up or i'm watching whoever's in front of me shoot it i'll kind of fine tune what i what i want to do or where i want to be and kind of drop the shells in there maybe i always spin the top barrel only just to kind of whatever you know want to see and then just kind of close the gun and go with it but i should probably take a little more time and and <laughs> think about what i'm doing and, and kind of just slow it down a little bit but 
when I get in a bind, I go a little faster to take the thinking out of it. And so I'm trying to train in a little more thinking. Well, what you need to do is spend a day with Kevin, then go spend a day with David. <laughs> find that balance. <laughs> yeah. That, that's that's for sure. Go from a point <laughs> point five second pre shot routine to a five minute root pre shot routine. <laughs> right. <laughs> Time day with a calendar, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um hey Kyle, so out of the out of the three main shooting styles, you know, you got your you maintain lead, your pull away, your swing through. What primarily is your go to style? I would say definitely maintained. I'm I'm almost always kind of starting or you know, when I sink up on the front side of the target, I'm pretty much where I want to be. And, you know, I may ride it a, just a, a half a second or a split second. And I may, you know, if it just doesn't feel right, I'll still have the lead I want. I'm just waiting to maybe even if I just calm down my hands a little bit and maybe make sure I'm synced up good and then, you know, fire the shot. But usually I'm start in front, stay in front kind Okay. And then as far as the other two methods, you know, the, the swing through and the pull away, I mean, do you feel pretty comfortable with those styles? Or are they ones that you actually use very often? Uh, I usually, you know, say swing through if I've got something real fast and the, the trap's kind of hidden and I can't see the trap or, you know, hard to pick the line. Mm -hmm. I'll usually let that beat me and then swing through it and pull the trigger, pull away, maybe, you know, fallen targets. I, I shoot a lot of fallen targets. I would, I think that would qualify. Mm -hmm. uh, so that or just something slow, you know, start on the bird and just kind of ease off of it a little bit and, and pull the trigger. You know, I don't use those a lot, but you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm comfortable with, with all of the above. Well, Kyle, you mentioned something before we started here. Um, and if you don't want us to bring this up, we won't, but you're starting to get into coaching a little bit. With that, you said that you're you're going through another learning curve and, you know, learning coaching, right? So with that, are you learning to try to stick with one method or are you trying to apply all methods with your students? I think everybody that coaches is kind of – they lean towards how they shoot, mm -hmm. and that's kind of – maybe it's easier to teach that because you, you, you're more comfortable with it. That's definitely how – you know, what little bit I've done so far, I, I'm kind of, you know, that's easier for me to see and easier for me to do. But if, if they're kind of, if that's their go-to method and it's not mine, then that's fine. As, as long as I can see down the gun or over their shoulder, then I can, I can help them out. Gotcha. Um, let me ask this question. I ask it all the time. You may have heard me talk about it. What's one small change that you made to your shooting game that seemed to make a big improvement or really helped you out uh, along the way? uh shoot more <laughs> <laughs> shoot more okay that's fair uh yeah i mean that's started shooting the regionals the championship tour last year did them all you know each year prior i kind of maybe i did one more than the year before that okay uh so i think that you know just learning a little more each year and going to more a huge difference i got a pattern stock from jim greenwood i I went from aiming at the target or, or looking at the whole target or, or even, you know, trying to hit the target as a whole to now I'm kind of more dialed into a specific part of the target, whether it's, you know, the rings on it or the, you know, the front, back, top, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of, I don't even know how to explain it. Maybe aim small, miss small comes into play, but that, that made a big difference for me. Like I, I, every shot got a lot more specific when I got a custom stop. Well, yeah, I just like to ask that question because sometimes, I mean, people talk about like an aha moment or when the light bulb comes on, like if there was a, a moment, you know, when you were coming along, like, Oh, okay. Now I understand what they meant about that. Cause I, I've had those moments and I know Jason has. So we always just like to ask that question just to kind of get somebody's feedback. Yeah. Both, both of what I would call my actual lessons that I took, you know, with Bill and with Zach, uh, both of those weren't an instant gratification type thing. Like it uh, replayed the lesson for several days or, or even weeks and, and, uh, practice at what we talked about and what we did. But, you know, when, especially Zach, like how to look at a target, you know, everybody says, look at the target, look at the target. But when you, when you kind of know that or, or even adjust to a certain way of doing it, that was a big like man I, I finally get what was what was said 
Well, you know, we've been huge proponents of coaching on this, and it, it really truly is the only shortcut in this game. Um, but it's still not like you're going to have a lesson and then all of a sudden you're going to jump 10 targets in your, you know, your average, right? And so right. you have to apply what you've learned. So that makes sense what you're saying for sure. Yeah, it, that was the – both of them really. I mean, you know, definitely more so the just looking, you know, pick out a – a certain spot to, to shoot and get a plan. You know, Anthony's always talking about, you know, make a plan and stick with it. Be, be, uh, confident in what you're doing. And early on, I, I didn't do any of that. I just got up there, dropped the shells in and, and let them rip. But now I, I like to think we got a little bit better game plan or, or even a game plan in general. And it's working out. Yeah. <laughs> so funny story. We were at a big station there at nationals and, I was first in the box, and I saw the show pair, and I turned around and looked at Sean, and he's got that smirk on his face, and he just kind of looks at me and says, now what are you going to do? <laughs> I said, I'm about to drop two white golds in and let it eat. Well, oh boy, was that the wrong thought to have. Um, so, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Planning is everything, and the ability to make the right plan. Sometimes when you get lost, a coach is what really helps with that, wouldn't you say? I would very much agree. It, uh, you know, it if I'm stuck, I can, I can call one of many and, and like, Hey, what, you know, what do you, what do you think about this? And, or even go home and watch TV and you're not actually watching TV. You're replaying what you just shot or, or yep. the day or the, the whole course. And, you know, not necessarily a lesson, but you know, anytime you're thinking about it or, or even this podcast, anytime you, you know, I listen to all of them multiple times, you know, it, it, just thinking about shooting or even diagnosing, you know, what you did the last time you went and practiced. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. I do it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's the little things that make a big improvement. It just, you just kind of got to pick them out of the, the pile, you know, so to speak. Well, uh, let me ask you this question. Do you have any pet peeves while you're shooting? Like, uh, do chatty people bother you or noisy golf carts going by or people that throw shells or get emotional in the box? Any of that stuff, uh, rub you the wrong way? <laughs> I, uh, I have picked up my fair share of holes from the years that I worked at the gun club. Uh huh. Uh, so if, for me, if, if you're shooting over and under, I mean, we all get excited, uh, but let's keep them, keep them in within reach of all the rest of them. Cause <laughs> you know, it's a, you know, even as a kid, just seeing somebody chunk them out there 20 yards or whatever it may have been, it's like, man, I got to go get that later. Yeah. So that kind of, that kind of rubs me the wrong way. And then you don't help any of your squad mates at all by doing that, you know, or getting emotional about it. So I just try to stay level headed and and do my thing and, and get out. And if I'm, I'm struggling with one, I mean, a lot of people say I grin or laugh when I miss because that's, that's an easy emotion to let out and you can recover from that easier. If you, for me, if I ever get angry or mad, then I, I don't recover very fast. So I'm, you know, I try not to go that route. Gotcha. Are you the guy in the box that tries to, or when you're on a squad, do you try to help your other shooters out, or is that only when somebody asks for help? Yeah, I uh, kind of growing up here, you know, all the local guys, uh, Robbie Purser's good about it. I mean, especially on practice day. I mean, you know, you miss one, that's you. You miss two, you probably don't know where you're at, especially if you missed it the exact same way. So it's kind of, for me, it's, you know, Hey, you missed two, then you, then you might ask one of your buddies or, or something, but I try not to say anything until it's, you know, till I'm asked. And if it's a tournament, then, you know, you, you don't really do any coaching, but you might, you know, like just look at it hard or, or something encouraging, you know, but that's test day. You don't want to, you don't want to give away the answers when everybody's there to, you know, right. <laughs> see, see how, see how they can do. And if, you know, some people, got somebody standing over their shoulder telling them exactly what to do every shot, then, you know, they do have an unfair advantage over the rest. Gotcha. What about, uh, you got any weird habits or lucky charms you carry with you, <laughs> yeah. when, you when you shoot? I, I guess not that I can think of. If I, if I get to a tournament and I'd, you know, get up two hours before it's time to shoot or three or, or whatever. And I have a good day. I just try to repeat that pretty much from start to finish. Nothing real you know major i very regularly you know two three maybe four make or breaks if that's an option before i shoot like i'm i definitely want to shoot 50 to 100 shots before i go shoot a tournament or or anything like that just to 
kind of dial it in, make sure my hands and my eyes are together and not kind of just go, 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 just kind of be kind of smooth things out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So you're definitely a warm up guy then. Yeah. I I do not like shooting without, (laughs) without shooting first. Right. Um, all right. So we're going to switch gears here for a minute. We, we have asked everybody this on this program. And the reason why we do it is because everybody gives us a different answer. What do you right. see as something that needs to be done to help improve growth in the sport? That's tough. Uh, everybody's, like you said, everybody's got a different answer. Right. Um, now, there's no right or wrong answer, Kyle. I just, we, we would really like to hear your opinion. Right. I honestly don't know. I mean, it, even if you break it down to a, to a state level or, or even to a club level, uh, you know, if you can fix the little problems, maybe the bigger ones go away at some point. I, uh, a couple of years ago, I didn't like how a couple of tournaments went. And when the, you know, election process came up for the, you know, GSCA here, the board, I tried to get on it and did get on it. And that's, you know, that's one way to do it is, is just kind of maybe speak your opinion and, and hear everybody else's and, and put it into play. I think you kind of did the same. Yeah, I'm I'm about to join you with feet in the fire, if you will. Um, (laughs) I, you know, and that's, I'm glad you said that because for me, I've always been taught you can't complain about something unless you've been there and done that. You know what I mean? And I'm not going to complain about an organization or the way a shoot is ran or anything else until I have been behind the scenes and dealt with it, if that makes sense to you and, and tried to help situations. So, that was part of the reason why I tried to get on the board with the OSCA, uh, Ohio State Sporting Clay Association, and haven't been to my first meeting yet. About the time this airs, I will be going to the first meeting, and, and oh, boy, I'm sure I'm in for a lesson. So um, <laughs> We call that baptism by fire, Jason. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. But, no, that, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that, Kyle. I mean, that's – so anything – should I wear, like, a bulletproof vest going in, or <laughs> is there any kind of advice you got for me? Or? I would say my version was uh, just knowing you're the new guy. You you got to, you know, learn that process and, and and how it works and and don't get too radical too quick. I, I I voice my opinion when I'm asked and sometimes when I'm not, but I've got the best of intentions to, you know, doing what I think we need to do to make things better or, or make it a more enjoyable, you know, shoot or a year or, or whatever it may be. Just trying to, right. you know, do what I think's right. And the only thing that makes that valid is the 20 something years that i've been around it and and i think that makes anybody have an opinion that's maybe even more valuable than somebody that's been in it six months and and, but theirs is still very valid but you know i guess you say the more you've seen or the more experience you've got maybe the more you know the more you can offer to help right i don't have any expectations going in really i don't i'm just trying to to sponge and learn if you will right Yes. All anybody can ask for is, I mean, voice your opinion is what you think would help. And, and that's, that's all we, any of us can do. Well, Kyle, let me ask you another question that comes up quite often. Uh, let's talk about master class for a minute. Uh, I'm sure you're aware. Oh, good Lord. You're not going to throw this on. <laughs> well, here's, here's the thing. Now, listen, and, and this is why it's valid. So Kyle, you know, you're you said, you just said you're working your way up. You're starting to kind of get on the heels of some of these better known shooters that always are in the top, you know, 10, top 25, that kind of thing, you know, so let's take masterclass as a whole. And, and we, we've always asked this question. Is there anything that you feel that can be done? to kind of, you know, level the playing field, so to speak. I know a lot of guys that are weekend warriors like myself and Jason uh, work very hard. You finally get to master class, and at a local level, you do fine. You know, you're competitive, but obviously when you go to some of the bigger state shoots, the regionals, and, of course, the nationals, well, then now all of a sudden you got to compete against, you know, your Anthony Matarises and your, your Zach Kimebombs and, and all those people that are just at the very, very pinnacle of the game. So, I mean, is there any thoughts on your end about how to diversify master class or change the rules somewhat to try to, you know, make it a little more fair for the for the little guy? Uh, that's... <laughs> 
hard okay. to do without step, stepping on any toes. No, uh, I, I know. I know it is. And, and we've talked about that at nauseum, but we always like to hear people's opinions. So, Right. Yeah, I would – I mean – there's been talk of a pro class and the, and you know, the PSCA came and went, uh, I thought that was great. It just, it didn't stick, you know, that it needed more help from the people within that whole, even I mean, probably more help from the shooters and, and, and maybe even some from the industry that was, you know, my opinion of why, why it failed or, or has went away for a little while. Uh, I think there probably does need to be a, a pro class, but, to me, the punch system is not the best to get there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you need to do it with with what you like. Say a shooter has won, like you know, put a put a value or or even you know, you could still call it a punch, but uh, make it to where all the entries and stuff like that. But say it's over four hundred entries on a big shoot, like a two day shoot, HOA, you know, gets say HOA gets two and runner up gets one. And that's the only punches awarded there. Well, you go back four or five, six years and you will separate the, you know, the, the actual pros from the master class and, and do that. But even it, like, say you've, you've done that and, and a little while down the road, you know, uh, you know, double a or a master class guy, you know, does HOA the event. Well, now they've got a, a pro class, punch or point and then when you know when those acquired whatever number there may be to you know then hey now now you're in pro class but you know only winning against the top and the best gets you that that point or punch and uh that i think would separate you know the the actual professionals or coaches and whatnot from the rest i'm you know I'm doing all I can do to become one of those guys and, and, and be at the top. But I mean, there's still, you know, there's 10 guys, 10, 15 guys in the country that are always going to be, you know, at the top. And and that's the, the guys that live it, breathe it and do it every day. Right. Right. Exactly. One of the things I've brought up and to some, it kind of rubbed wrong and others agreed with me. So we'll ask your opinion. Um, I've done a lot of other forms of motorsports, uh, r- racing and whatnot, and all of them have a point series. And, you know, if you go back and look, a lot of pro sports have point series. What I mean by this, Kyle, is the national champion is decided about who shot best out of four days in late October, right? And all these other championships are based on a series of points throughout the year that led up to a championship. Do you think that would help the sport a little bit to have something like that? Or do you think it's fine the way it is? I think it would, uh, it would be hard to, to do or, or, uh, you know, this coming year in 22, the nationals is going to have a super squad or, or a system for that. I think that's a, a big step in the right direction. Yes, I agree. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I like the fact that, you know, Hey, if you're not in the super squad, you know, especially me, cause I'm not, if I go have a good, a good week or a good four days or four events, then, you know, it is possible to still win. But once you've entered that super squad, like, Hey, you, you, you got into the top. You're, you're one of the big guys, you know, you got to be here if you want a chance at it. Uh, I like, I like that fact. Otherwise everybody's going to back out and it's not going to go anywhere. Right. Um, but I, I mean, here in Georgia this year, we're doing a, a, a circuit shoot, uh, you know, points acquired throughout eight shoots, you know, one a month during the, hopefully the better months. And, and, uh, you know, to, at the, at the end, you know, you don't have to win everything, but you get points for every time you go. And that's seems to be drawing some bigger numbers and better interest. And, and, uh, you know, that's the name of the game. I think just get more, more people shooting or, or you know, in the same spot at one time and, and grow the sport. Yeah, for sure. I think the other thing too, that's missing is a title sponsor. You know, you look at all these big races and stuff, they have, you know, monster energy or whatever, and they're dumping tons of money into that point series or that championship. And I think that's what we're missing is an outside sponsor, not somebody within the industry, not a shell manufacturer, gun manufacturer, because let's face it, they're just, completely drained with 
sponsored shooters and sponsoring different shoots. If we had an outside sponsor that could put up that title money, if you will, I think that would help tremendously. Yeah, I want to say when I first started, maybe the NSCA or the the just the complex there was sponsored. I want to say by Chevrolet well, uh, for a couple of, couple of years. But yeah, Sean and I shot the Chevy Tahoe Challenge, and that was in the late oh, gee, many Christmas. That was in the late nineties, <laughs> um, and that might have not even been NSCA. That might have been the USSCA, but yeah, um, I can't remember. They it? had a Chevy Tahoe Challenge, and it was a point series, and it was also done on a um, handicap system. So anybody, didn't matter what class you were in, could win. Um, and the the award was a Chevy Tahoe at the end of it. So, but yeah, I don't know if that's what it's going to take, or one of these energy drink sponsors, or you know who knows. But somebody with I don't know. This is I'm speaking way out of my head, or way over my head. I just I should say I don't know. I'm just trying to help. You know, I, we're we're trying to improve the sport and trying to figure this out. So, um, Kyle, you know we we do the rapid fire questions. Do you want to do that with us? Yeah, that's fine. All right. Uh, what kind of gun you shoot? Shoot a Krieg off 34 inch parkour. Parkour. Okay. And are those fixed choke? Yes. What constriction are you running? Uh, 2030. Wow, that's tight. Um, <laughs> ported or unported? Unported. Okay, in stock. You mentioned you have a custom stock. Right. I, uh, Mr. Jim Greenwood uh, has just finished and, and gotten the final stock to me. So Nice. Um, shells? I've uh, got RC4, Champion Excellence. And what recipe is that? That's a one-ounce 1290. Okay. Uh, are you a seven and a half or eight guy, or do you switch? Uh, usually all seven and a half for a couple of years now. Gotcha. And I already know this answer, but some people might not. What what vest do you wear? <laughs> uh, bear pelt. Nice. Do you prefer the game? Or well, no. Wait a minute. I'm I'm gonna screw up here, and Heather's gonna give me a phone call. Do you <laughs> do you prefer the competition or the competition light? I like the competition. It's uh just the colors are sharper. Gotcha. What kind of glasses you wear? I've got Pila. Uh, your hearing protection? Uh, just the ones from Granny. Uh, just silicone molded, custom. We need, not not the not the electronics. We need to put you in touch with Doctor Grace. You need to try them one time. I'm telling you, these Yoda Pros, you're gonna love them. But yeah, I've actually been considering that lately. Well, they're, they're nice. We'll we'll talk off air. I'm gonna hook you up. I'll. I'll put you in touch with dr grace i think you'll be pleasantly surprised um kyle i know we talked before the podcast here you've got some new sponsors and some people you'd like to thank yeah uh big big year for me last year i felt like i did decent or a you know good finish uh Krieg off picked me up on on team Krieg off that's that's super exciting for me uh recently uh rc ammo or rc usa has, has picked me up so i'll be shooting that that rc4 1290 this year that's that's exciting i'm you know bear pelt we started last year you know can't thank them enough that's that's a great product love that and kind of dominic at the meadows he's he's helped me out i mean he's the he's kind of the new guy there or, or the most recent and i've lived there grown up there you know my whole life so that that place is special to me Gotcha. Well, Kyle, it's been awesome having you on here. We really enjoyed uh, catching up. Like I said, we, we saw you down at the Nationals briefly, uh, and we also talked to you a little bit at, at the uh, Game Board Invitational, so that was nice to get to know you, and we're glad we uh able to get some time here to, to get to know you a little bit better. And uh, any final thoughts or, or anything you want to mention before we wrap this up? Just ready to get into some warmer weather. I know everybody is, and and get it where it's more comfortable. Yeah. Uh, I thank you, thank you guys for doing it. The, you know, I think the podcast has has helped a, a many of people, and it's a a huge step in the right direction for the for the new guys, and and even some that's you know been doing it a while, and you get to hear hear everybody's thoughts and and what's happening, you know, all over the country. Yeah. Well, Kyle, thank you for saying that. We appreciate. Yeah, that. we do appreciate that. Um, are you ready to give some information about coaching, or are you just just starting to step into that fire not quite ready yet <laughs> uh i'll let y'all decide i uh 
I've been around it a while. It's just that's that's a new step for me, and and you know, I'm not gonna do a bunch of it, but I I don't want to turn it away like I always have. You know, I'm new to it. There's a learning curve for for me and for even a new shooter. So, well, but I think you have, in my opinion, way enough experience to take the new guy and point him in the right direction. Yeah, for sure. I agree. Um, if, if I were you, if you want to, I would throw either an email or a phone number out there and let that guy get a hold of you and maybe you can take somebody under your wing and get them up to the top. Yeah, I'm not against it. Uh, numbers 478-973-3814. Uh, Facebook message, you know, Instagram, all that. I'm on there. Uh, pretty easy to to find or get in touch with i try not to not return any phone call or message that's kind of a i guess that would be a pet peeve from earlier but uh, <laughs> run a podcast you'll see what I, it's like sean puts it best it's like herding cats so <laughs> <laughs> um but kyle thank you very much man we sincerely appreciate you spending some time with us i appreciate it i hope i didn't uh Hope it didn't butcher it up too bad. No, no you did great, Kyle. The, the wife's great. sitting here smiling, so you must have done pretty good, or she'd be waving her hands up in the air and smacking me in the head. So, <laughs> but thanks again, Kyle. We'll catch up with you soon. I know we're going to see you here real soon at some shoots. Uh, we talked about that, and looking forward to it. I do appreciate it, and, and looking forward to it also. We can sit down and have a chat in person. Heck yeah! Yep. All right. Thanks, Kyle. See you, bud. Have a good yes, evening. Sir. You too. All right, we're going to take a quick break from Kyle to do these quick segments. All right, joining us on the phone, Chris McAfee. Chris, how you doing today? Doing good, doing good. Hey, Appreciate for, you guys having me on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Hey, for those of you uh, that don't know Chris, Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and what class you shoot in. Yeah, I, I'm Chris McAfee. I'm from uh, just outside of Dallas, Texas, a little town called Royce City. About 30 miles east of Dallas, um, master class shooter, been a master class since really 2018, really been back in the shooting game, shooting a lot since 2017. So cool. kind of kicked it off a little bit in 2001 and realized real quick, as we all know, the sport's expensive and oh boy. wasn't really far enough along in my career. So that's kind of where I came back to it in 2017. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Chris, let's switch gears here to Bear Pelt. Where did you first hear about the vest? You know, I actually saw David wearing one at a shoot, and I was like, okay, I kind of came out of the, the fishing industry, and I'm like, the sublimated jerseys, this is a great idea. Looks comfortable. I obviously kind of saw the, the name Bear Pelt on the back of the vest, went online, looked it up, called Heather, and had a design started within about a week of seeing that. Awesome. Well, um, so when was that? When did you buy your first vest? I ordered my first one in May. I think I got it in in June. Okay. Did you go with the competition or the competition light? I went competition um, for about two weeks, found out about the competition light, and ordered another one. Because <laughs> as everyone knows, it's hot in Texas in the oh, summertime. Oh, man. Yes, it is. Yep. How's the uh, competition light vest been holding up to the heat? Oh, it's great. It, it was a game changer for us in Texas. I mean, I, I was basically between stations. I was taking my vest off every time. Yeah, because I could not stand to have it on because it's just too hot. Yep, yep. So now I just leave it on all day. It's comfortable. No issues with fading, any of that kind of stuff. Heat, perfect That's for the awesome. summertime here. That's well, awesome. You you might have just answered my next question, which is, you know, what's your favorite feature of the vest? I, you know, the, the first of all, the, the movability. Um, it's comfortable. It moves with you. Uh, this the second thing is it's it's not not as hot. But on, to on top of that, you don't get um, – I mean, I've had – I don't know, I've probably got eight or ten vests sitting in the closet now that every summer I buy another one because it's faded and turned to a different color. Right. So now with the bear pelt, sublimated, you don't have to worry about that. Throw it in the washing machine and move on down the road. Right, right, exactly. Well, for other people out there that may be considering one, what would you tell them uh, to maybe get them off the fence and have them go ahead and pull that trigger, so to speak? I, there's a couple things. There's a lot of people in, here in Texas that have, have, have wear, especially in the summertime, wear the, sh the shell pouches. So for me, it's consistency of mount. Um, no matter what I've got on under that vest, my mount's the same every time. So if you're shooting it with a shell pouch, you, you've all worn that shirt that's a little bit slick or you've worn one of those shirts that has a little bit of a hang up. 
if you, if you'll buy one of these vests, you'll get to the point where that mount is consistent every time. Mm-hmm. Second of all, it's customizable. Get what you want, get it fitted the way you want. Price is consistent with, um, I say half the price of, of other vests. Um, hence the reason I have two. I shoot in the competition during the winter and the competition light in the summer. And it's a, uh, just a better option all the way around. Gotcha. Well, definitely sounds like you really like it. Uh, anything else you'd like to add, Chris? No, I think just if, if you look at the made in the USA part of this, if you haven't met, if you didn't get the chance to meet Heather and Eric at nationals. That was the first time I had met them. I've been on the phone with, with Heather, I don't know, 10 or 12 times, uh, trying to work on my vest plus getting a vest for our club here in Texas, Texas gun ranch, uh, getting that set up. Great people to work with. Um, it's like I told Heather and Eric when I first got on the phone with them, I don't think we realize what you guys are going to do to this industry, and I hope you're ready for it Yeah, because it's coming. Yeah, I think Eric was taken a little aback by how successful they were, how quick they were. But, you know, I told him, I said, you guys created a product where it speaks for itself. You know, they really did. And they're good people, you know. Um, I don't think you get two better people running a – a company in this industry making such a great product. So, Absolutely, and, and very responsive. I mean, if, if I had any kind of question, any kind of issue, um, even other people that I've gotten to go ahead and make the order process, Heather will call me. I can't get a hold of so-and-so. Can you please get in touch with them? It, it's been a great process and a great uh, company to work with so far. That's good to hear. Well, Chris, I want to hear you say it. At Bear Pelt. It's not just your vest. It's your uniform. Awesome. Very good. Awesome. <laughs> well, Chris, thank you very much for coming on with us. We really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to run. We've got some other guests to get to, but we'll be talking to you soon, I'm sure. Sounds good. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. See you. All righty. Joining us for this RE Ranger segment, we have Jared Stansfield on the phone. Jared, how are you today? Hey, good. How are you guys? We're doing great. Doing good, Jared. Thanks. Hey, uh, for our listeners out there, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what class you shoot in, and, and give us a little bit of down and dirty. Yeah, um, I live in Manchester, Massachusetts. Grew up in Connecticut. Um, went to school in Boston in uh, 1970 and never went back. So uh, technically, I'm, I guess I'm a, a mass resident. <laughs> it happened. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I grew up, I did a lot of hunting as a kid, a lot, especially a lot of ducks and pheasant. And when I got to uh, Massachusetts and right around the 1980 time frame, I started shooting trap and I shot redshirt targets for a good 20 years anyway in the trap game and then kind of got, you know, family involved and couldn't do a lot of things. So, and I gradually transitioned over into the clays game and I've been there ever since. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about your RE Rangers. Um, tell us, uh, have you had other glasses before and why did you settle on RE Ranger at this point? Yeah. You know, when I started shooting trap, I was, um, I've had to wear glasses since I was nine years old. So let's get started with that. And, and over time I ended up using a uh, contact lenses, but my first shooting glass that I, I first started was, uh, the Decot and, uh, and they're still a great firm and a great, make great glass. And then at one point I managed to get, uh, before they were peelers, they were uh, high def specs. And, and I had, uh, a couple of those and I used them. Those are great lenses too. And then I got friendly with uh, with Sarah Deco, who's I think was her grandfather started uh, Randolph Engineering, and uh, got to be friendly with her and her husband. And it's so close. I mean, Randolph, Massachusetts, is just down the street for us, for really. And um, I tried their I tried their lenses. I got rid of the pilas, and I've been using them ever since. Now I did start with the edge uh, was the frame, and I had I still have four different um, lenses for different light conditions for that. So you are uh, prescription then, right? They're prescription no, lenses. No, well, I, I, yeah, I, I have at one point I was. I have other frames from Randolph that I had to use, and then um, they use Morgan Optical in New York um, to make the prescription lenses. But then I really shoot, shoot mostly, or I was shooting mostly with uh, contacts, so okay. I didn't need the prescription lenses, and that gave me an easier. I, instead of getting all these expensive lenses, I just had to keep just get the new regular lenses that weren't prescription, so it was less money. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, uh, and I have pretty bad vision, and then uh, I uh, I had cataracts. I'm an older guy, so I, I had cataract surgery a couple of years back, and it went from zero to 100, if you know what I mean, in terms of my vision. I mean, I went back to being 20-20, which was first time since I was nine years old. So now, uh, so I've been using the, the Ranger glasses, and I'm just, just having a great time with these, and 
And now that I got my eyes fixed, then I just had a, a recent tweak in my left eye. There was some scar tissue there that got fixed right there in the office. And uh, it's just perfect. So, so I thought I had the best lenses in the world, and I still use them. And then last summer, I got to, to, to try the new AI lenses from Ranger. And I was uh, like pretty impressed right off the bat. Um, we shoot quite often in Rhode Island at Addyville East Farm um, and other places in New England, of course. But from better or worse, that's my home course. And we shoot a lot in the woods there. And I was, uh, we're subject to some pretty crazy lighting conditions with, especially if there's any misting or rain at all, uh, gray, gray light, you know, which is, could be, you know, a flat light. It can really be hard for a guy, especially my age, to be able to pick up targets. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where that AI lens comes in. I tried them and uh, Sarah goes, what do you think? I went, all right, well, it took me a while to get around to going down there and actually buying a set, but I finally did. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of, lenses that are out there they're all real good everybody's got their favorite stuff i know guys shoot pilas they shoot this all stuff but i will tell you about the ai lenses and my buddy gabe a shooting friend of mine went down at the same time we both bought the same frame we bought the falcon frames and the three lenses the light medium and the darks and we all had the same reaction to it was it gives you depth perception that is remarkable now it's it's a subtle it's kind of a sublime kind of change for you but when you're older like me and you put these lenses up to you, and you now you can see the dimensionality changes. So you, and we would call it depth perception. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, when you can see and you can focus better, I'm not sure how they did it, but uh, it worked. And, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and so the, even my, the darkest of the three lenses are, aren't as dark as some of these other lenses I've had in the past. But it doesn't have to be. And the it, like if you're shooting in a woods like we do a lot in New England, that there's a transition thing in there from dark to light, light to dark, and at the flat light too, which we get everywhere. Now you'll see those same kind of woods conditions that down at M and M and Anthony Matarese's place, where you're in the woods, the big rangy targets that you shoot out in fit task, not so much, but in the woods, boy, it can be you can get that strobe effect going. Well, mm-hmm. these these uh, AI lenses stop all of that. Word for word, I can agree with everything you said. When I got my React lenses, I'd been shooting Pila prior to that. And again, great lenses. I had some really dark ones, some middle ground ones, and I had some night vision ones for, for low light levels. But when I got the React, I was absolutely blown away. I mean, it's not like anything like mega, like you see where it just makes the clay like a, a beacon, but man, it does definitely sharpens everything up and it just for some reason makes everything easier to see. So yeah, they, they're actually great lenses and I, I love mine. I mean, I can usually put the dark ones in and leave them alone for the most part. Yeah. So you got the three, uh, the, there's a light, medium, and a dark, right? Correct. I mean, that's what that's what's available, yeah. Yep. Um, See, I'm still running the, the old school one, minor prescription, and I'm waiting on the prescription reacts to come out. So I'm still running the old school edge with the three lens kit that are prescription. Oh, yeah. I think Sarah mentioned that that was, that was they're working on that, but that yes. wasn't available just yet. Yeah. Well, by the time people are hearing this, they'll be out. But, uh, yeah, oh, nice. I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm trust me i'm checking the mailbox probably twice a day <laughs> chomping at the bit he yeah. is chomping at the bit but oh, uh, yeah well jared man it's been awesome talking to you and a uh, excellent description on those react lenses glad everything's working out for you and uh hopefully we will see each other out on the field sometime soon absolutely yeah take care guys appreciate it and uh go ranger that's all i can say <laughs> there you go <laughs> thanks <laughs> thanks jared, thanks, jared. All right, take care uh, yeah. bye 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 well, what do you think jason I think it was an honor to have Kyle on. That's what I think. He's definitely one of those guys that's nipping on the heels of the top shooters, and I hope he gets there. Yes, me too, and I think he will. He's got a lot of passion, a lot of ded- dedication. He's come a long way, and uh, we've seen him shoot. He, the boy knows how to shoot, that is for sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, I have a question for our producer, Uh-oh. my lovely wife, my beautiful wife. I have been asked this question, and I've avoided answering it, especially on the podcast. So now I'm going to let you answer it. Now you're in the hot seat. Great. Everybody wants to know why you're not shooting. Uh, Well, because I have a job and a podcast to edit. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, makes sense. Makes sense. And, uh, yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe I'd rather shop. (laughs) (laughs) I'd say that's probably a good one. Well, no, it's a good answer. It's, it's okay. I mean, it's not everybody's thing. I mean, we're talking about a person that has an art degree, right? So she's well, not into... Well, there is one other thing that I've never wanted to mention to you. Um, I'm and really, now you're doing it on a podcast. I'm, I'm doing it now. I'm 
I've always been afraid that I would kick your ass, and Ooh. and then that would be a problem at home. Ooh, golly. Okay, all right. Guess who's <laughs> editing this podcast? Yeah. Jason's ego just got stomped oh, on by boy. size 14 combat boots. You know what? I just, no, I'm, I'll edit this one. Anyway, so uh, excuse the... Um, Poor editing. If uh, Le- leave audio it in, Jules. Quality, just just right. leave it in. That's funny stuff right there. Leave it in. So anyway, we're gonna move on from that. Um, recently, I had a picture of Jules' daughter, my stepdaughter. Um, she was, and this is again. I, I've said this a million times on this podcast about the safety in this sport. She recently shot a charity tournament with her law firm, and had a blast. Had a ton of fun. First tournament, right? Or first. Set, yeah, turn, first turn tournament. Scenario. Yeah, yeah. Uh, rented gun, didn't fit, no vest, no experience, and just had a blast. Went home happy. Um, went home healthy, no injuries, no problems. The very next day, she's playing pickleball with her boyfriend and blows her knee out. Mm-hmm. Does everybody understand now the point that Jason has been trying to make on his podcast about how this is statistically the safest sport? This needs to be pushed, don't you think? Well, yeah, well, when you're standing there in the box, you're not really doing too many hard cuts on your legs and stuff, <laughs> like you are on pickleball. But, but so. you're, you're, don't you think you're no, not ab- getting my point? No, in? absolutely. That that is a great point, and we've said it time and time again. You do not have to be any kind of super athlete to shoot this sport. Um, you don't have to be any particular age. You just have to be strong enough to hold the gun, point the gun, and learn how to shoot correctly. Absolutely. Um, we're going to get going. Um, thank you very much to Bear Pelt, Atlas Traps, Odo Pro, Negrini, Rhino Chokes, Ranger, RE Ranger Glasses, KL Ammo, Game Board US, and White Flower Targets. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for bringing us great guests like Kyle Millwood, um, Sean Alley. Yeah, keep uh, keep those questions for the coaches coming in. Uh, check out our YouTube page. We're going to have more segments coming up, uh, visual segments, video segments. Um, also, take somebody shooting. Take somebody shooting uh, to a tournament. Uh, just get people introduced to the sport, yeah. and we'll, uh, we'll all grow the sport, and we'll you know, be happier down the road. And to answer my wife's question, no, she would not be able to compete with me. Until next week, Mr. Alley. <laughs> we'll see you right here on the Dead Pair Podcast.